Sutherland Springs was ever famous. It was a century ago when it positioned itself as the Saratoga Springs of South Texas. Residents hoped to lure travelers to the Hotel Sutherland, a 52-room modern marvel with amenities such as toilets and running water and its own electrical generator. But Sutherland Springs never became the destination that residents intended a century ago, but that has not bothered the current residents of this quiet town. They've been content with the relative anonymity and would have preferred to stay that way. But then last Sunday happened. And the entire world, it seemed, learned the location of Sutherland Springs and the tragedy of the attack at First Baptist Church. And yet again, and yet so soon, we are left struggling with questions of violence, faith, and fear. Just last month, Las Vegas, just recently, New York City, and now South Texas in a church, no less. A place where people turn for peace and, and community. This attack feels rawer than the others, partly because of the geographical proximity, partly because of the spiritual proximity. One of our former Oak Hills members bravely engaged with the shooter. One of our families at Oak Hills West Side lost two relatives in the shooting. So this attack strikes close to home. How are we to process it? We were scheduled to study the promise of God to Gideon. And if you're following in your study book or, or watching the curriculum videos, Gideon is still scheduled and still a part of our community group discussion. But given the question that's on all of our minds and hearts, and even the sadness, the heaviness that's been on our hearts this week, I thought it best to take a slight detour and, and look at an additional promise, but not the promise we intended to study, but a promise that I will share momentarily. But first, I'd like for us to pray. And this is a prayer based on God's promise to us from the book of Psalms. It's a promise that's found in Psalm chapter 91. And I'm simply going to use this psalm as an outline for this prayer. And if you will allow me, I'm offering this prayer on my knees. You have said, Father, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so we will say, Lord, you are our refuge. You are our fortress, our God. In you we choose to trust. You shall deliver us from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence, and you shall cover us with your feathers. Under your wings we shall take refuge. Your truth shall be our shield and our buckler. And we will not be afraid. We will not be afraid. We will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. For you have given your angels charge over us to keep us in all our ways. In their hands they shall bear us up, and we shall not bear, dash our foot against a stone. 
You have set your love upon us, Father, and we trust you. We beg you now, Heavenly Father, to have mercy upon our neighbors in Sutherland Springs. To have mercy upon those who have survived this horrific attack. To have mercy upon this small town that has to bid farewell to their loved ones. To have mercy, Father, upon all your churches. And to have mercy upon our church, upon your church, O Kills, that you would keep us safe. That you would stand as the ultimate guard over your church. Do not let our children, our grandchildren be afraid. Do not let our single moms or our single ladies be afraid. Do not let fear stalk our hallways. Do not let it, Father. We know, Heavenly Father, that in this world no one is truly safe, but we in your hands are totally secure because you hold us. Grant, Heavenly Father, that we might process this rightly, biblically, truthfully, not with naivete, nor with undue dread. Please, Father, this prayer we offer in the name of Christ and all who agreed with it said, Well, contrary to what we would hope, good people are not exempt from violence. Murderers do not give the godly a pass, and rapists do not vet victims according to spiritual resumes. The bloodthirsty and the wicked do not skip over the heaven bound. We are not insulated, but nor need we be intimidated. Jesus has a word or two to say about this brutal world in which we live. He said, do not fear. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Of all of the promises of Christ, this one might be most honest and unadorned. It's very realistic. He never promises that Christians will be spared persecution or violence, but he firmly assures us that no one can touch our soul. As one of my friends said this week, we may not be safe, but we're all secure. Secure in God's protection, secure under God's sovereignty, secure under God's great promise. And so it seems right that we invite Jesus to minister to our hearts because unless this is an unusually supernatural crowd, there are some of us who are struggling with the violence that we are seeing. We're struggling to make sense of it. We're struggling how to process it and what to do with it. I would imagine the disciples were struggling with some of the fears that they were facing. Jesus, just prior to this promise in verses 17 through 23 of Matthew 10, had told them to expect scourging, trials, death, hatred, and persecution. Not the kind of locker room pep talk that rallies the team. Yet to their credit, none defected. And maybe they didn't because of the fresh memory of Jesus' flexed muscles in the graveyard. Look at this ultimate display of good versus evil. It's just a couple of chapters prior, probably just a week or two, maybe three prior to the passage that we just read. Jesus had taken his disciples to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, where two men were demon-possessed. They met him as he was coming out of the tombs. And they were so extremely violent that none could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, 
What business do we have to do with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? The most immediate and dramatic reaction to the presence of the Son of God on earth came from demons like these who recognized Jesus immediately. These demons, these numberless, invisible, fiendish followers of Satan. These two men were demon-possessed, and Matthew is quick to point out, consequently, they were exceedingly violent. They were exceedingly bloodthirsty. Can we take a moment and disclose the source of all violence? And that is the devil. He created it. He distills it, and he distributes it. He is resentful toward the fact that he was not given the only throne in the universe. And he is resentful toward the fact that the angels do not worship him. And he knows that his time is short. He knows he will be ultimately punished. And he is on a war path of violence. And he seeks to suck all who he can into the vortex of his fear. He prompted Cain to kill Abel. He prompted each murder since. And it is no coincidence that the demons of gatherings in this story were exceedingly violent. People walked in wide circles around the cemetery to avoid them. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. He marched in like he owned the place. The stunned demons never expected to see the Son of God right here in the devil's digs on the foreign side of Galilee, the region of pagans and Jews. Jews avoided such haunts, but Jesus did not. The demons and Jesus needed no introduction. They had battled it out somewhere before. And when the demons saw Jesus, did you note, they had no interest in a rematch. They didn't even put up a fight. There is much theology in their question. Have you come to punish us before our time? They know what's coming. They know what's coming. They know they will be defeated. They know they will be cast into the lake of fire. They know their time is short, and they know who calls the shots. They immediately stuttered and backpedaled and hemmed and hawed. We know you're going to put it to us in the end, they're asking, but are you going to give us double trouble in the meantime? They crumpled like stringless puppets. Look at their pathetic appeal. Look at this. Please send us into those pigs. Wimpy, sissy demons who strut about our planet thinking that they're controlling the world and yet one appearance of the presence of Christ and they ask to be placed into pigs. So Jesus did all right, go, Jesus commanded them. He needed no shout, no incantation, no voodoo, no tribal exorcism, war dance, no incense, no smoke, no magic formula, just one small word, just one small word. He who sustains the universe with a word directs demonic traffic with the same. This one word prompted the hymn writer to pen these words. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. 
His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. So the contest between good and evil lasted a matter of seconds. (laughs) Christ is fire and the demons are rats on a ship. The first sign of heat they scurried overboard. Church, this is the balance upon which Jesus writes the check of courage and hands it to you. This is why he says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Jesus invites, invokes, he welcomes us into a place of courage because he knows and he has seen that Satan cannot touch that which will last forever. And that is your innermost self, the soul. And because Jesus wins the battle of good versus evil, you can win the battle of faith versus fear. You can win this battle. You can. I mean this. You can win this battle. You can win this. Because by the grace of God, he will deposit within you a wellspring of confidence and courage. It is not his will that you or I live a life that is marked by trepidation and fear. It is not his will. Can anything separate us from the love Christ has for us, wrote the apostle? Can troubles or problems or sufferings or hunger or nakedness, or look at this, or danger, or violent death. Nothing above us, nothing below us, nor anything else in the whole world will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are people of courage, not because of our muscles, but because of our Savior. And courage emerges not from increased police security. God bless them. And may God protect them. But courage, our courage emerges not from increased police security, but from enhanced spiritual maturity. As we trust in the sovereignty of God and deposit our lives squarely under his protection. Martin Luther King got this. He chose not to fear those who meant him harm. On April 3rd, 1968, he spent hours waiting in a plane on the tarmac due to bomb threats. And when he arrived in Memphis later that day, he was tired and hungry, but not afraid. And he told the awaiting crowd, we've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter to me now. I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned with that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land, and I'm happy tonight, and I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He would be dead within 24 hours. But the people who meant him harm fell short in their goal. They took his breath, but they never took his faith. And for a time they have silenced his body, but they have not silenced his soul. Evildoers have less a chance of harming you if you aren't already a victim. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, says the Bible. But to trust the Lord means safety. Remember, his angels will guard you. He is your refuge. 
He is your hiding place. He is your fortress. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We're not foolish. We're not naive. We're careful. We're mindful. We do our part. But nor do we cave in to a fear that leaves us in a cave. We walk by faith. We need to believe this. We really need to believe this. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, told us that in the final days, in the last days, persecution of Christians would increase. He was straightforward with us. He said, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. It seems no coincidence to me that the Sutherland Springs slaughter occurred on the day set apart for the churches to pray for Christian martyrs. Hatred still abounds. More Christ followers have been killed for their faith in the last century than in all previous centuries combined. The global evangelization movement reports that an average of 165,000 martyrs per year, four times the same statistic of a century past. I know we read this and immediately our thoughts go around the globe. And well, they should, so should our prayers to places of intense persecution. Yet America, as proud as she is of religious freedom, suffers from an increasing anger toward Christians. Professors publicly mock Bible-believing students, talk show hosts, denigrate people of faith. Jesus promised that Persecution would increase as the end draws near. He also says, as it does, the fragile convictions of many Christians will collapse. He says the love of many will grow cold. Ill-equipped to face persecution or surprised or unaware of God's honest warnings, the love of many will grow cold. Spiritual stowaways will jump ship. The half-hearted will become cold-hearted. And a great many church attenders will be disclosed as faith pretenders. They will not only leave the faith, but they will make the lives of the faithful miserable. Will this persecution come to us? Well, for some of you, in one way or another, it already has. You feel it at work. Maybe you feel it in your family or in your neighborhood or in your school. For many of us, it might. And I think we would be wise to be prayerful and careful. If we're ever thrown into jail for our faith or disposed for our convictions, may God help you and me to remember the counsel of Christ. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Don't get me wrong. I pray God blesses all of us with a wonderful, safe, happy, long life well into the many, many decades. But I also pray that he spares all of us from panic, that we wouldn't be people who live on edge, always anxious, troubled, looking over our shoulders, unable to rest, ever upset, This is a time for faith, not fear. It's a time for peace, not panic. We avoid Pollyanna optimism. We gain nothing by glossing over the brutality of the human existence. It's a toxic world in which we live. But nor do we join the chicken little choir that parades about telling us whether on Facebook or television. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. 
Somewhere in between Pollyanna and Chicken Little, between blind denial and blatant panic, stands the clear thinking, level-headed, still believing, faithful follower of Christ. Wide-eyed yet unafraid, unterrified by the terrifying, the calmest kid on the block, not for lack of bullies, but for faith in his big brother. The old people of God knew this peace. Though a host may camp against me, one of them wrote, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. After the bombs of World War II ravaged downtown Warsaw, only one skeletal structure remained on the city's main street. The badly damaged structure was the Polish headquarters of the British and Foreign Bible Society. And the words on its only remaining wall could be seen from the street. The words said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is a picture of the Christian hope. Though the world may collapse, the work of God will endure. This is the assurance which sustains Joe Holcomb The gunman nearly wiped out the Holcomb family, leaving Joe, 86 years of age, to mourn the generations he had raised. But he has been quick to say he does not grieve like those who have no hope. We know where they are now, he said in one interview, his voice strained by exhaustion. All of our family members, he said, they're all Christian. It won't be long until we are with them. They can take the body, but they cannot touch the soul. Amen. And so, Heavenly Father, we lift this promise back up to you, thankful that you gave it, asking that now we can begin to stand upon it and that we could be that loyal tribe, that, 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 that quarry of people who find themselves standing on faith not heeding the voices of fear. We pray this through Christ. Amen.